Um, good afternoon from London, everybody, to the third one of our series, Becoming Human. Um, and today we're going to focus on the area of cooperative childcare. Did cooperative childcare make us human? Um, good evening, good, uh, good morning, wherever you are. Um, and we haven't sadly got our facilitators, Helen and Katrin with us for various reasons. Um, but Chris, you, you can help with that, can't you? You can help do um, uh, any facilitating that needs, but we've got quite a nice small group. Um, do you, do you want to just do that? And maybe each one of us should introduce ourselves and then we'll start. Uh, so you want us to go around and we all say who we are? Yeah, or uh, the, the key speakers, every, if anybody else wants to introduce themselves, of course, that was, I, yeah, that's also possible. Um, I don't know, why don't you start? You say who you are and we can it, By you, you mean me, do you? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, not a, yeah. I I'm, not, I'm not a key speaker. Okay, well, I, my name's Chris, Chris Knight. I wrote a Pretty good book, actually, I think, when I read it again um, in 1991, called Blood Relations, Men's True Asian and the Origins of Culture. And um, it hasn't had too much impact um, being on, on those topics, of course, but um, it's just often described as well, a slow John, John Hawkes. John yeah. Hawkes was flagging it up the other day. So Re Recently, it's been gaining a lot of currency, which I'm really pleased about. And I'm, I'm also usually described as... Um, the founder, there were a few of us founders, but the founder of Radical Anthropology, which is London's longest running evening class going back to 1978. Wow, okay. Um, and I am uh, Camilla Power. I've been organizing this little series. Um, I'm an evolutionary anthropologist, so I'm particularly interested in the emergence of symbolism, symbolic culture, ritual, etc., um, and we so that, that's kind of my general area. But um, I'll say a little bit today about Sarah Hurdy's work, um, and then hand over to Darsha. Would you like to introduce yourself, Darsha? Sure. My name is Darsha Narvaez. I'm a professor emerita of psychology at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, USA. And my work is uh, kind of comprehensive lifespan development of morality and flourishing. And I'll be talking about that. Great. Mona, maybe say something. Yeah, thank you, Camilla, Darcia and Chris. Um, I'm, uh, my name is Mona Finnegan. Um, I'm a social anthropologist whose fieldwork was with uh, the Benjele Yaka um, up in the northern forests of the Republic of Congo. Um, I'm interested in everything that, uh, that people have just mentioned. So the relationship between menstruation and culture, the relationship between cooperative child um, rearing and culture, um, I'm really, I'm, I'm really interested in the relationship between uh, women's ritual life and their procreative um, statements and 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 coalitions, um, and I'm interested in morality as well. So, really looking forward to hearing from others. Yeah. Thanks very much. Does anybody else want to say who they are? I mean, it's quite nice if we have an idea. Of for why people came along or what they're interested in, if anybody would like to. I will uh, introduce myself. I've been a fan and colleague of Darsha's for ooh, a decade, probably. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker, not an academic. Um, and back 35, 40 years ago, um, it, it became apparent that your voices need to find ways of getting beyond the academic community and being, you know, expressed in the common domain. And how do we reach parents? How do we connect with parents? Um, which is always an evolving challenge because they're, they're on this timeline, you know, they're on this conveyor belt and their interests change. So it's it's really quite challenging to 
to take these ideas and present them in ways that actually capture the, the meaning for the current crop. Um, so I've been doing interviews with people like you for 35, 40 years. Uh, I have a small nonprofit called Touch the Future, which is the archive of these interviews. They began with Ashley Montague, that he was my first hit. Um, what a delight to spend time with him and be friends with him. David Baum was a colleague for a number of years. Um, um, when Gabor came out with his book on addiction, I went up to Vancouver and met with him in his home and interviewed him and tried to bring his voice forward as many in many ways as I could. Um, and I have a little project, um, hopefully in the works with Darsha and Gabor to create a, a dialogue between the two of them about a whole full range of topics that I think would be stunning. Um, and again, it's it's to give both of them a, a different platform to share their visions. So that's my, uh, Darsha sent me the invitation. Oh, lovely. Great. That's Gabor Mate. Gabor Mate. Yes. yes. Yeah. Lovely. That sounds great. Sounds like it might might get some um, attention. Yeah. Um, any anybody else before we get going? Otherwise, we'll launch in. I'd like to go quick. Yeah. Um, Peter Barris. I'm I'm working on a book for several years now, and what I'm really interested in is that there are so many disciplines and uh, areas of mastery and activism and healing and so forth that appear to me to be converging now uh, on a on a very close examination of the human condition and all seem to be pointing at the same thing uh, it's, it's incredibly complex and the noise of the of the attention age is such that it's, it's just not uh, the, the public discourse is apparently oblivious, but I don't think that matters. And I think that if humans evolve uh, in a way that allows us to uh, avoid extinction, we may not even notice how we did it. Mm -mm. Mm. Yeah. Any, any more um, people like to say something or orient themselves? In there? If not, maybe we should just um, crack in and we'll, if um, I, I'll sort of say something first um, and then we'll have a space for any discussion and then Dasha, and then we're gonna um, go, go out um, with, with Mona, hopefully, um, which will be a, a lead to a long, rich discussion, I should think. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit about Sarah Hurdy and put the context. We we put out that very nice brief intro article for Sarah's from um, 2009 when she published this uh, fabulous book, Mothers and Others, which I think of as as a Bible, really one of the greatest books ever written on human evolution. And um, Sarah Hurdy should be way way better known than. Stephen Pinker, she's, or anybody such as the likes of Jan, um, what's his name, Harari, um, anybody like that who've been mega bestsellers on issues of human evolution. But Sarah is a real evolutionary anthropologist um, with many long decades, starting work mm -hmm. with um, primates, with little monkeys, langer monkeys and applying her understanding of monkey sexuality to um, a perspectives on the evolution of human, of women's sexuality. Um, and she's produced a whole series of books with starting with the women that never evolved, um, going through mother nature to this culminating classic book, um, Mothers and Others. And she's really paying attention to the, the big question of why, you know, why are humans so extraordinarily what's been termed hypersocial or pro-social? Um, obviously, humans can behave horribly and badly to each other, but the default 
for kind of human nature is not to, to do that. The default for human nature is to be able to be very highly cooperative, even with people who are complete strangers. Um, and she starts off with this picture of humans on an airplane as her, I think it was about the era when they had that film, Snakes on a Plane. So instead of snakes on a plane, she's thinking of apes on a plane. And she's just thinking about when you get on a plane, how you know it's tricky to get on with your near neighbors and you're all feeling uncomfortable and fidgeting and um and you don't feel in your best you know, your best mood but nevertheless you do your damnedest to be cooperative not not always not always but you do your most to be cooperative and helpful and then she contrasts that picture with well what would happen if you were in an airplane with a bunch of chimpanzees you'd be lucky as she says to get off with your fingers or your testicles or your toes intact um, if it came to chimps and, ju and just as Richard Wrangham was saying, you know, the, the amount of, of levels of actual incidents of violence with chimps are orders of magnitude greater than would happen in, in the same kind of, of, of group of, of um, yeah, same kind of group density of humans. Um, so she's asking, well, how does this arise? And Amongst the theories that are being proposed are ideas of so-called Machiavellian intelligence, that as kind of brain sizes get bigger, neocortex expands, um, increase of intelligence, and that this would be giving rise to, you know, Machiavellian intelligence is about sort of cooperating to compete in some senses. It's very, it's got a very competitive edge and apes, great apes have theory of mind and they try to work out predictively what other animals are going to be doing to try to get that little edge of advantage. Um, but what they're not doing, which we talked about in the earlier episodes of this series, what they're not doing is letting other apes read their own minds. So what Sarah is saying is so, so special to humans is this aspect of mutual mind reading, also known as intersubjectivity, that and connected with the shape of our eyes, the, the mechanisms of being able to read eye movement and eye gaze as, as a, a basis for sharing attention, joint attention. And um, so that intersubjectivity is critical. And Machiavellian intelligence, which is really about one way mind reading, not being receptive for another another individual to read what you what what you want what your emotions are and um, another area that's been posited as a way to explain our super sociability is has been group on group conflict and this has been really trendy the idea that humans you know develop morality in relation to the need for group solidarity against other groups um i don't know how many of you've been watching this um Chimp Empire and Gogo -Go Chimpanzee Community Netflix documentaries, which would be absolutely stupendous in, in my view. They're amazing for, for watching chimp behaviors. Um, but there, it's quite clear that chimpanzee, or, chimpanzee societies are organized in terms of the opposition between groups of chimpanzees that are in, in really ferocious competition with each other for resources. Um, but but humans do not have this level of of groupish not not this sort of you know there there can obviously be with human groups hostility to outsiders and um uh, uh, it, that obviously does motivate in many human societies but it isn't intrinsically human and it is certainly not an aspect of human hunter-gatherer societies where there's a tendency to want to create far-flung linkages between communities rather than any kind of territorialism. Um, so I'll just read a quote from early in Sarah's book about this way, her attitude to this, this idea that's come from many people like Richard Wrangham, people like Stephen Pinker. Um, I could go through a whole list of, of different people who've argued that warfare, group on group competition is the source for morality and group solidarity. And this is what um, 
Sarah's saying here. Um, she says, well, I'm not going to say competition's unimportant. This comes from page 20 of Mothers and Others. What worries me is that by focusing on intergroup competition, we've been led to overlook factors such as child rearing, which are at least as important, in my opinion, even more important for explaining the early origin of humankind's peculiarly hypersocial tendencies. We've underestimated just how important shared care and provisioning of offspring by group members other than parents have been in shaping pro-social impulses. And that leads to um, her, the, the theory that she expounds through the book, that what is it, what was the social context giving rise to, um, to these extraordinary, this extraordinary development of hypersociality and prosociality, and fundamentally babysitting. We became the babysitting great ape, that mothers could give over their babies, could get a break by giving over their babies to others to take care of, at least for a, for a time, um, and that enabled mothers to freed them up for all kinds. But it was, but it's in setting up this triad of mother, baby, ca other carer, that all kinds of specific interactive and, and becoming intersubjective behaviors arise to keep all the members of that triad in touch with each other and their behaviors that lead to an evolutionary trajectory of meshing mental states of wanting to mutually mind read each other and share emotional states and understand what what each other is feeling in in quite specific ways is is what she's arguing now this has all kinds of implications it's got implications in terms of what kind of society, what, what kind of social context our ancestors lived in. Because from a point of view of great apes, it's very difficult, in fact, for mothers to simply hand over very vulnerable young primate babies to others. Um, and the prime reason why it's so difficult for great apes to do that is that, um, they do not, generally speaking, mother great apes are not living close with female relatives. Generally speaking, mother great apes are likely to have moved from a natal group and to be in amongst strangers, fundamentally. Um, and they don't, or and they, they do not necessarily have the sufficient trust to be, be able to, to let another individual, whether that's female or certainly not a male great ape. If you've seen the chimpanzee empire, you'll, you'll, you'll be quite aware of that. A male great ape is not a good candidate for handing over to infant care. Um, but there are exceptions. There are very interesting exceptions. Um, and I was talking on Twitter with Jill Pertz, who is the director of Bongoli, um, a Senegal savanna chimp project and she said she was putting out tweets about a particular young female chimp that they were all expecting to be going emigrating because the young female chimp before she's going to get pregnant she goes she leaves the group and goes to find another group and um, and in this case they've been watching this particular individual I think her name is Luna and Luna turned out to have already had an offspring so she was there in the group where her mother was. So I was asking Jill, well, are there any, is there any evidence of some grandmother behaviors happening in that situation? And she was saying, yeah, there was. So interaction of mother, daughter, the little infant. So it's just showing that there is this plastic capacity in the situation where mother with her mother and then an infant as the kind of core unit for this, this cooperative childcare to start to, to begin, um, it's possible to happen. Um, and in her book also, Sarah Hurdy is noticing situations in zoos, again, captive chimps or bonobos, where that situation may arise. And of course, there's the famous um, family from Gombe, the F family, 
where chip, female chimps were not the, the, the favored F family, the females were not moving out. They were sticking where their mother was. Um, and that was a huge advantage for those female chimps. So in our evolution, if we or, it, or our ancestors were great apes, so we're great ape ancestors, but hominin ancestors who were staying around where their, their moms were, um, and that would have been a huge advantage, particularly for hominins coming under pressure of increasing brain size. We looked uh, last time at the degree of increase of brain size and the idea of the so-called gray ceiling that we can see in the fossil record. So the idea of the gray ceiling is brain size um, can only rise to a certain level if a mother is raising the infant completely by herself. If she's doing it by herself, there is a ceiling, a gray ceiling on the extent to which brain size can increase because she has to produce all the energy required by that, that, that infant, that, um, that infant that's targeting that adult brain size. Um, so we can see in the fossil record for all the fossils prior to two million years, fundamentally they're underneath that gray ceiling. It's indicative that those um, species of Australopithecines and um, even some early Homo have not yet gone, they have not yet gone past that gray ceiling. It's indicative that mothers are still doing a large amount of the work by themselves. Um, but with early Homo, and particularly the emergence of Homo erectus, our ancestors smash through the gray ceiling. And the only way they can do that is through some version of cooperative childcare involving, and the, the best candidates for being involved in that childcare to start with uh, would be the mother's mother, as in line with grandmother hypothesis, but also her oldest daughters potentially. Um, and then of course sisters would be cooperative to each other. So we can, we can look at um, particularly monkey models where females generally are living, they may well be living in the same group troop as their mother with their sisters, um, helping their daughters. This is quite common for monkeys. Monkeys do lots of babysitting because of the female kin coalition setup. Um, and so it becomes very important to understand cooperative childcare in terms of this a long evolutionary trajectory for, for genus Homo of very close female kin connections. And that that is kind of the core social, social unit in our evolution. And of course that goes against a great deal of the kind of prejudices of expectations of, well, great apes, they always emigrate from the group and most human societies are patrilocal and females leave the group. But of course, as Sarah, um, analyzes and she knows about in uh, the book. She's talking about the much more recent analyses of hunter-gatherer societies, which have shown that actually no patrilocality isn't characteristic for most hunter-gatherer societies, certainly not African hunter-gatherers, um, and that there can be multi-local um, residents, you know, a lot of flexibility around residents, but there's also a life history effect whereby when a young woman starts having children, she's highly likely to be in the same camp as her mother. And my experience with the Hadza, um, fieldwork with the Hadza, definitely following uh, work by James Woodburn, who also had these findings as published in Man the Hunter, you know, there, there are core female kin frameworks really um, mothers and daughters are very likely to be together in camp. Um, you also get kind of cores of, of, of sisters or cousins that are matrilineally related to each other. Even though perhaps later on, as a, as a woman has children, she might then move more towards where her husband's kin are, if that marriage has, has maintained itself and she, well, they, they might move around. But um, but female kinship 
sisters as well as highly cooperative. In fact, there is um, some evidence, though it's not well published, of Hadza sisters um, sharing breastfeeding, doing this sort of very intimate shared childcare, um, which is, is well-known practice among Central African um, hunter-gatherers, some, some Central African hunter-gatherers as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know, if, uh, Chris, if there's anything else I haven't said there about Sarah Hurdy. I mean, there's so much to say um, from her book, but these are some of the, the kind of key aspects of this really important theory of, of shared childcare as quite fundamental to human evolved psychology. Just briefly to say that um, so much so-called knowledge about chimpanzee behavior uh, comes from Gombe, from Jane Goodall, and, and of course, Richard Wrangham, her student. And, and it's so clear that if the resources are scarce, uh, and the females need to be quite separate from each other because otherwise there'd be resource competition and they're and are therefore isolated. Then what happens is that you get the, the, the group of males um, imposing pretty severe dominance over all the females. But it's equally clear <laughs> that if you go to another part of Africa, right over to the Thai forest in the West, where the females aren't struggling against each other because there's plenty to go around and they do form coalitions, then the females uh, are able to stand up for themselves and the males may be a bit dominant sometimes they're not particularly well behaved of course but the scale of male dominance is is drastically reduced until and then of course if you go across south of the Congo river to where some uh, chimpanzees managed to get about a million years ago and there was a wonderful richly resourced area of wetlands and marshes and <laughs> all sorts of lily bulbs and stuff and you can see bonobos today in those areas of course, the females get so bonded that they end up with a matriarchy. So the critical thing is that there's no sort of genetically determined social structure common to chimps. It all depends on circumstances. And as Camilla was mentioning, the um, the chimp empire, which I absolutely so recommend, it is absolutely an astonishing piece of, of filming, astonishing piece of research. There are two groups. One is a very big group with lots of males. The other is a group and when I say lots, about 15 or 20 males patrolling their territory in a rather militaristic way with severe male dominance. And even in the same area, just across you know, a few trees away, um, there's another group with only eight males. And because um, in their case, they really have to have a lot of solidarity to sort of compete against, the, the if you like, the, the enemy group, then the males, there's no, no one's dominant. All the males are more or less egalitarian. And the females work with the males, um, do the same kind of patrolling. There's not very much male dominance and the females actually go hunting together with the males. So it's, it's the, the, yeah. the, 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 the message is nobody should think there's any kind of, you know, genetically specified social structure. It really does depend on circumstances and the circumstances which enable the maximum amount of gender egalitarianism, even among chimps, never mind humans, chimps. where there's abundance. So where you've got real resource abundance, you're going to get equality and where the scarcity is going to lead to um, the kind of conflicts which then, of course, intensify that scarcity, as Jerome points out. You get a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy with scarcity, where scarcity produces inequality, but the competition then intensifies the scarcity. And the, and the exact opposite dynamic when you have an economy of abundance or even superabundance, as, as we know from the, the Congo people, where the people, as Jerome points out, and I'm sure Mono can support this, they don't know what scarcity is. The idea that anyone could possibly starve is a concept they don't even have in their heads. Yeah. I just want to add a little extra point, some, say something about um, male involvement as well, because what's interesting about the whole cooperative childcare model is that actually it, it kind of shifts a trajectory towards um, male strategies becoming increasingly similar to female strategies in many ways. That, that the more that males get included into childcare coalitions, um, for instance, we, when we come to hunter-gatherer camps, uh, a woman's had a, new, a newborn baby um, just, just born, and that baby in, in the, that day will go around every member, like 14 people at least, will be holding that baby that day, which is something almost inconceivable among great apes. It's completely inconceivable. Um, 
and it will include men and not only the pr the probable father um and yeah so so this is sometimes been termed biocultural reproduction it's like it's it's reproduction that's kind of free of the biological brute facts if you like um though of course in an evolutionary trajectory we have to be paying attention to facts of kinship and and who's related to whom for for getting the behaviors going but in these female cooperative coalitions of course will be born males will be born male hominins young young evolving humans and what will happen with cooperative childcare is the interbirth intervals get shorter as the mothers get better support and as they wean youngsters very young in fact humans tend to wean children very young compared to great apes and um, so brothers and sisters will tend to be much more similar in age than great apes would have bigger gaps between the siblings and um, and brothers and sisters will also tend to be staying in the same groups residents as you know as as humans take longer to actually grow up to sort of sexual maturity so these are life history effects that come out of uh, uh, of cooperative childcare as well so brothers may be quite critical in particularly this is an almost a novel relationship brothers and sisters um having these long-term relationships which don't so much happen with great apes because one or other sex will tend to go at sexual maturity um relatively early and because there's a lot of age gap between them so in some ways male behavior that not necessarily associated to pair bonds but male behavior associated to sibling bonds may be quite a critical novelty in the evolution of of cooperative child care and um, and people like karen kramer um have argued that we can make a case for cooperative child care preceding the emergence of pair bonds in humans and hominins um we can't really do it the other way around you can't get pair bonds first and then cooperative childcare. you get cooperative child care first then you might have arguments why pair bonds could could be established out of that um but but cooperative child care may be fun the found the foundation um and potentially males involved in those coalitions may be related males rather than pair bond males specifically i think i've said enough for now we, we need to move on um so i think it's dasha next you want to say right. is there any comment maybe if people have questions or comments or okay uh, you write some comments little, before we go to dasha yeah if there is anyone it's just we've been 35 minutes already that's just a bit concerned yeah, we've got, we've got time. let's go with dasha though yeah let's all right hello everybody good to be with you thank you so much camilla and chris wonderful introduction there i'm going to share my screen and share the powerpoint okay so i'm going to talk about what we call humanity's evolved nest it's the hunter-gatherer childhood model according to melvin connor uh, we use the term also evolved developmental niche in our fancy academic papers uh, because someone said nest is too too primitive. It's not <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, now we're changing. We're going to use evolved nest. It just uh, rings true for a lot of people. So my uh, question here is: Is the evolved nest essential for developing our species' nature? So let's find out uh, what I've been working on for maybe the last 20 years. What has gone wrong with humanity and how do we repair ourselves? Uh, my area, as I said, is uh, pretty interdisciplinary. I've had multiple careers and uh, came late to studying uh, moral development and have realized uh, that it has to be the answer to this question is a transdisciplinary one. And so we need to understand all sorts of things uh, before we can shift away from the path we're on. Well, how do we know really that something has gone wrong? Uh, I use a lot of data from the United States because it tends to export its ways to the world. 
and it's just getting worse and worse by the day. Uh, mental illness, violence, drug addiction, suicide, uh, shrinking lifespan, uh, everyone under age 60 today is at a health disadvantage compared to the 16 other high income nations. Our child well-being is ranked near the bottom of the high-income nations, and we just had a, port, a report come out this week on the epidemic of social isolation and loneliness, which started even before the pandemic and has continued uh, getting worse. At the same time, humanity is destroying their habitat, a, a habitat for all life, really. And of course, it's not all humans doing this. Uh, and we've got massive... Uh, Breakdowns in earth systems, ecological disruption everywhere, visible wildlife decreasing by 50%, massive poisoning of soil, air, water, animal bodies, oceans are filling with plastic, there's climate instability, and it's it's going to uh, we're going to skyrocket the temperature in just a, a few years. So we've <laughs> we've been around for two to six million years, depending on how you count it. And it's the last 5,000 years, something went off the rail our 1% of our existence, we have been earth destructive and self-destructive, I would say. So this, I'm, I'm giving you very condensed information here, moving rather rapidly because there's so much to, uh, to integrate. So uh, we can, you can ask more questions later about things. All right, but how do we know that humanity hasn't always been kind of the way we are today? Always been self-centered and aggressive and felt miserable <laughs> through life. Uh, well, to answer that question, we need to understand our deep history, and we can examine the life ways, the well-being, and the human nature of those whose cultures extend back for tens of thousands of years. They are not uh, causing these issues, and they're not miserable. So who do we look at? We look at those who represent our 95 to 99 percent of our existence as a human genus, depending on how you count it. Small band hunter-gatherers. The San peoples, for example, have been in existence for over 150,000 years in Central Africa. These are nomadic foragers with few possessions. Their immediate return societies, by and large, versus delayed return societies like ours, where uh, we invest in cultivation of plants, domesticating animals, and we accumulate resources and actually hoard them. And uh, these uh, nomadic foragers are still in existence around the world, of course, under duress from globalization and other pressures. So what do they know? Well, they provide a model for repairing ourselves. And this, again, takes transdisciplinary perspective. And what is that uh, overall? What's the requirement that we need to take up, and that is about reconnection. We need to reconnect to our nature, uh, to nature, uh, speaking broadly. So to the, ourselves, what does that mean to be connected to yourself, to others, actually also to the cosmos, to the universe. And we need to reconnect to how we co-construct the world by the way we act, think, feel, uh, and are. And so how do we do that? How do we reconnect? Well, we need to follow what I call the species typical pathway that's found in these regenerative communities, those small band hunter gatherers. What does that look like? I call it the wellness informed pathway, uh, which is different than uh, we, we talk a lot about these days, trauma informed practices in the United States because so many people are traumatized, easily triggered into shutting down or getting angry. Um, but people have to understand that that's not enough to be trauma informed. You need to also be wellness informed so that we can actually meet uh, the needs of people and uh, fulfill our potential. So we have two gaps. We have uh, the gap at the bottom of our development, uh, which so we've been missing these things, right? Uh, and that is to meet human basic needs and foster thriving thereby. But we also have this top gap where people are missing capacities that we find in small band hunter-gatherers is heart-mindedness, a sense of connection and flow with others, and an earth-centered living know-how. They, they're not out there destroying and exterminating other life forms, right? Because they know how to get along and, and keep things flowing uh, and in balance by and large. 
So what is uh, what are our basic needs? Well, we know uh, these are just a sampling of things that we know that animals, uh, as animals, we need nourishment, warmth, protection, and safety. You need to feel at home in the locale. Every animal wants to explore where they are, so they feel uh, placeful, essentially. Uh, we're also mammals, though, so we need affection and play and, and included in the uh, group. Social mammals in particular need extensive bonding, community support and social enjoyment, and then all sorts of human needs uh, that are unique to us um, <clears throat> that Sarah Hurdy uh, noted the uh, importance of intersubjectivity, that sharing of mind, heart, emotions, cognition with multiple adults, not just mother, right, or mother and father. And the immersion in communal life, how important that is for developing our nature, meeting our needs. Apprenticeship, making meaning from the stories we're told and practice, the ceremonies we participate in, and the ability to expand the self uh, through healing practices and other community celebrations. So what does this lead to? Well, it leads to human thriving. Now, if you look at the list here, I know very few people that exhibit all these things, right? But this is what we are, are is documented among the small band hunter-gatherers, <clears throat> the, the Bushmen, uh, the Sun peoples, uh, pre-conquest peoples, according to Richard Sorensen. Uh, and we can see the thriving individuals have quiet minds. They're innerly happy and even childlike gleeful. Uh, They're vital and fully alive. They have full autonomy. They're not bossed around or uh, self-doubting. They have they expect honesty and are honest. They have a good sense of humor, lots of laughter. Outstanding memories and senses can learn things in a snap if they will it and, and can build habits at will. They have know-how for getting along in the particular landscape. They're ecologically attached and they connect to spirit. They have aware of awareness of reality beyond the manifest. And in relationship, they enjoy being with others and enhancing their well-being. They are relationally attuned and responsive. They have empathy, listen unconditionally, or communally oriented, authentically helpful, uh, exhibit unconditional love and forgiveness. Of course, you know, nobody's perfect. It's not universal all the time, these things. But uh, by and large, these are common characteristics. So they're generous. They expect sharing. Uh, they're egalitarian. They respect ancestors and future generations. It just uh, goes without saying, in a way. And they're responsible, in essence, towards the web of life. Now, these things are, um, as I said, um, on average, uh, probabilistically uh, characteristics. Well, they also develop a certain way of being with others, relationally attuned. That's this ability that chimpanzees do not display, right? Their relational attunement, they're fully present in the moment. They show a small ego because they're aware of this uh, common self, sense of connection to others which is developed and primed by the evolved nest, which I'll talk about shortly, and develops this sense of secure attachment, which is beyond just mother, it's to uh, multiple others and to the natural world through companionship care and this communal imagination. When needed, they're able to think beyond the face-to-face -face and do so with uh, a greater re egalitarian respect and sense of responsibility. Their agency and communion with others flow together. It's not us against them or me against you. It's uh, us together in a flow. So all this is con constructed postnatally. And finally, the last part of the wellness informed pathway, I suggest, is that we end up with earth-centered living know-how when we are uh, nested well, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we have a sense that to um, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. We just have a deep sense of that uh, as we grow into maturity. So the path to wellness then follows this um, cycle of cooperative companionship, which starts with companionship care from conception, the feeling of, of welcoming and support, which builds a healthy psychosocial neurobiology, which I'll mention quickly later, and leads to adults who are well and wise. And then these adults create a community, foster and maintain a community that attends to the basic needs and keeps this cycle going. And this is what we can see then in the societies that are regenerative, in the societies that are fostering, 
what I call our human nature. So what does that companionship care look like? We call it the evolved nest. And I could speak for hours about the evolved nest and all the components. Let me just say it's the, every animal has a nest, we do too. And it's the set of social and ecological circumstances typically inherited by members of the Giffen species, which are matched up with a maturational schedule of the young. So it's one of many inheritances beyond genes that we have. Mostly uh, these characteristics are over 75 million years old. Uh, it's as if evolution has done the experiments on what is adaptive. And they're provisioned by a community, the community that uh, Camilla was talking about of the allo parents and the allo caregivers. And it's especially important, the nest, in early childhood because our uh, young, our newborns, resemble fetuses till, of other animals until about 18 months of age with rapid brain growth and body growth underway, but especially the brain is shaped by the experiences that are being uh, provided by the members of the community. So baby needs need to be met quickly to foster a well-functioning brain. The evolved nest then involves uh, soothing perinatal experiences, so welcoming uh, gestation during pregnancy, birth is calm and nourishing and no separation among the baby, no painful procedures, no infant circumcision, you know, and all that stuff that happens in medicalized birth in the United States. Uh, and then on request breastfeeding for several years, the average age of weaning across the world. So these characteristics come from all the hunter-gatherer studies around the world uh, that have been summarized in the book uh, by Hewlett and Lamb, uh, Hunter-Gatherer Childhoods and Melvin Connor's uh, chapter especially. Uh, and then I've added a couple more um, that were not listed there, but that are common uh, around the world. Uh, so on request breastfeeding, the average age of weaning is about four years. Uh, and that's because our immune systems take about that long to develop. And breast milk has all the uh, building blocks for the immune system and many other things. Um, and I could say so many things. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that our um, jaws have gotten smaller in the last hundreds of years since industrialization. When women stopped, this is European skulls primarily, uh, when women stopped breastfeeding to go work in the textile mills. And you can see the jaws that are uh, different uh, in size and it's caused uh, sleep problems because the palate is too narrow and orthodontic problems. Uh, and so we can see that there are significant physiological effects of the uh, different aspects of the component or the components of the nest. Positive moving touch we know is so important. Animal studies show uh, that when you remove a, a, a baby from a mother that all sorts of systems get dysregulated. Um, and humans are even more sensitive than uh, rat babies, for example, and no negative touch. Uh, it should uh, that changes the trajectory of development. We have longitudinal studies showing that spanking is like physical abuse uh, to children. They become more aggressive and self-centered and so on. Positive welcoming climate so that throughout childhood and throughout life, actually, you need to feel like you have connections, that you matter, that you belong. So all these components, actually, except for the first two, are part of the nest for everybody. Number five is uh, self-directed social play. This means not uh, organized sports. It's uh, children running around and creating their own play, their own uh, chase or climbing trees and so on. All sorts of genes are turned on, expressed through this and all sorts of self-development, uh, wonderful things of self-control and all are developed. Allo parents or allo mothers, as uh, Sarah Hurdy uh, has termed it, are really vital for this because you don't want to just have one uh, caregiver. You don't become as flexibly attuned and ability uh, able to uh, relate to multiple others if you only have one caregiver. Uh, and these people then are supporting the mother as well so that uh, she can be present and not overwhelmed, uh, which, yeah. And then uh, responsive relationships, meaning in babyhood, meaning keeping the baby calm, while, uh, which keeps the biochemistry in a growth mode. If you just stress a baby, you're leaving them alone or leaving them to cry, 
that's going to shift trajectory into uh, either slowing down growth or growing the wrong things, the self-centered aggressiveness that we see so commonly in the United States in adults. Uh, and then number eight is nature connection and nature immersion so that you build a, a sensitivity and relational attunement to the natural world around you, whether where your locale is, and you feel uh, concerned for it and responsible. And then also healing practices. So routine ways of getting rebalanced uh, physically, relationally, uh, communally with the natural world and uh, so on. So that's just really for us. All right. So what does, uh, why is it so important? Well, there's a constant interaction between nature and nurture in, in childhood and early life, especially epigenetic things are happening. We are de developmentally plastic. Uh, we're dynamic systems. So whatever happens in the early stages of a dynamic system affects the trajectory um, later on. So it's really important to get to set things properly. I think the evolved nest may be a keystone for developing our human nature because we are biosocial creatures. Our biology is shaped by our social experience and our sociality is dependent on how well our biology works. So caregivers are co-constructing all sorts of things, emotions and cognitions, which in the brain are intertwined. The sense of self, uh, the social self, moral self, is this, a, am I a good person? Am I a good, good uh, creature? Is it safe to be here? So is the social worldview is also affected, relationships. Are they trustworthy and so on? And in effect, babies need a womb with a view. Uh, this is Montague's, uh, Ashley Montague's term, the external womb experience, exterogestation. And that's uh, what we don't provide much in the United States. And what happens when you, uh, in those early years, this is Jean Leadloff, the accidental kind of anthropologist, <laughs> amateur, uh, who was astounded by the Yaquana and how differently they were and in, in all these characteristics I mentioned of flourishing and thriving that we don't, she didn't see in the United States. Uh, she was with them in the 50s, but didn't write her book until the 70s. And this is a quote from her, the feeling appropriate to an infant in arms is his feeling of rightness or essential goodness, the premise that he is good, right, good, and welcome. Without that conviction, a human being of any age is crippled by a lack of confidence, a full sense of self, of spontaneity, of grace. When the Dalai Lama first came to the United States, he asked, what's wrong with everybody? Well, they are not getting this nested care. And that's been going on for decades and maybe centuries. Uh, and so they're lacking that sense of confidence and grace. And then it leads to various problems. And one of those most significant aspects of not provide, being provided with the evolved nest in early life is the right hemisphere under development because it's scheduled to develop more rapidly uh, in the early years. And it's related to self-regulation of all kinds, uh, vagus nerve, uh, endocrine system, stress response, um, intersubjectivity, that ability to mind meld and take perspectives, uh, emotional intelligence of what's going on inside yourself and uh, interpersonally, your sense of empathy, your sense of being in your body and being here. All these things are associated then with the development of the right hemisphere and are underdeveloped when uh, early care is not nested. It can develop throughout life, though, with play and uh, spontane spontaneity in the present moment. So it's not hopeless for us who <laughs> missed out on the nest, right? Uh, and we also, uh, the other aspect that gets missing then from that early undercare, lack of nest, is this sense of spirit. And Colin Turnbull, the anthropologist, has this quote about the Mbuti. He talks about the awareness of spirit that enables one to accept differences of manner, custom, speech, behavior, even of belief, while still feeling an underlying unity. It is awareness of spirit that enables one to avoid the conflict and hostility that arise so easily from such differences. So that, again, that's a right hemisphere directed aspect of being human uh, to be really connected to the cosmos. So what happens with a degraded nest? Well, you're going to have dysregulation of all kinds. It's going to seed ill health, uh, mental problems, physical, social, moral, because you're going to get have this righteous morality where you want to dominate others. 
and you're disconnected from cell phones, community nature. And I have this um, moral theory called triune ethics. I talk about this based in Paul McLean's triune brain theory, which uh, identifies global brain states, which is what this is based in. We're born with survival systems, these emotion systems that uh, all mammals have, and the stress response system as well. It's intertwined. These are innate, and but uh, we're mammals, and the mammalian aspects of our capacities to care or love and play with others have to be grown postnatally primarily, and our executive functions and our ability to think well are also grown postnatally, highly affected by our experiences. So uh, this, these are the abilities then that uh, um, <clears throat> enable us to think about things outside the present moment, to abstract, to imagine, interact, uh, and so on. So with good development, with nested development, these things, uh, these abilities control the survival system so that if they get activated accidentally, oh, that's nothing there. That's a, just a shadow. It's not a, a lion after me. Oh, I can then calm down right away. And you spend your time mostly in this heart-centered, what I call heart-centered imagination. So your mammalian um, aspects, your social mammalian aspect uh, is really dominant and you use your executive functions when needed, but it's also always rooted in your sociality. Now what happens with undercare, the lack of nestedness. Oh, before that, sorry. <clears throat> so I think our human nature is actually what I call this social engagement ethic and a communal imagination ethic. This is our moral nature that we evolved to have with nestedness. Now, without nestedness, what happens is these survival systems get enhanced because there's early toxic stress. So you're enhancing the stress response. You become threat reactive and easily triggered into shifting blood flow to run away, right? Or to fight. Uh, and that doesn't help you think well or be open-hearted or open-minded. And it actually shuts down your higher order thinking then and, and controls your ability to imagine alternatives. At the same time, if this has been an experience in early life, your um, mammalian sociality doesn't grow properly. You don't get enough experience with empathic others uh, to develop your loving and caring systems or your playful, interactive, flexible systems. And what you end up with as your ethics is self-protectionism. Face-to-face, -face, you're either going to be oppositional and kind of fight, or you're going to withdraw because you don't feel safe. And then when you use your imagination, it's going to be more about controlling others, what I call vicious imagination or just detached, you know, relationally and emotionally detached. You just think about your thing, you go in the ivory tower, right? And you think about all the models and stuff that don't have you uh, relate to people face to face and that's too hard. And what happens also is uh, you can see this then in the Western world that we are stuck in these root metaphors, which uh, Chet Bowers called a straight jacket. It's really hard to get people out of this. And where is this coming from? Where are these coming from? These very familiar lists of things. There, it's an underdeveloped right brain, enhanced survival systems, and an enhanced left brain ego consciousness, right? So this left brain is very much about control. It's very much about, you know, categorizing and sorting and hierarchy. Uh, and that's where we are now. So we have patriarchy and uh, dualisms of all kinds, West and the rest. Right, and the twofold logic, either or, instead of either or, both and, fourfold logic. And all these uh, things that are driving us crazy and uh, increasing inequality and misery. And authoritarianism is part of this. Violence and cruelty is, you know, a moral, <laughs> moral behaviors against nature, children, and others. So which pathway, which human nature are we going to support? The current trauma-inducing pathway is what we're on. We don't meet basic needs. We foster ill being. And then we end up with individuals and communities that are toxically stressed. And their hearts, their spirits are locked down. They cannot reach their potential. And they have a lack of know-how for holistic, compassionate, regenerative life. The alternative, of course, is our wellness promoting pathway where we meet basic needs, promote health and with thriving, 
develop heart-minded individuality, uh, individuals, sorry, and community, and a know-how for holistic, regenerative, compassionate lifestyle. That's my story. So a lot of what I've said is in this 2014 book, Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture, and Wisdom. Uh, it's for college uh, graduates, really, for that reading level. And then these two books, the Restoring the Kinship Worldviews from last year the, and, and the Revolved Nest coming out in August, these two are written for non-academics. Uh, so please um, uh, send me a note or uh, ask me questions about anything. Thank you so much. Marvelous. Thank you for that. Does, are there any um, questions straight into Dasha? Um, just people want to say anything. That was very fast. <laughs> very <laughs> dense. A lot of, a lot of ground there. <laughs> my, my, my own feeling is that it would be good to have more on the next and then because then we can have an open really free open discussion free about absolutely everything yeah, together, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. great we've got we've still got over now i guess there is one question oh i can't see one uh is that Matt? oh that was, was peter me, wasn't but, it peter? but we were gonna wait until later is that right okay I, I, you know what, everyone, I mean, let's see what the consensus is, but I feel like what Garcia has just said is so powerful. You know, I, I will, my entire presentation is kind of a response to what Darcy is saying, um, but I feel like I don't want to lose the thread. It would be good to take questions now, you know, to come back to what she's just given us. You're in charge then, Mona. Yeah. <laughs> Peter. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I, I took notes as you went, and the first one <clears throat> had to do with this idea that uh, hominins have been around 22 to 6 million years, and the last 5,000 have been Earth's distinctive. <clears throat> and I had recently been boning up on network science, and uh, supercriticality is a term in network science, which refers to a moment when a network consists of nodes that are each connected to another or others, but not in uh, large components with a lot of connections. And then when that happens, uh, the next connection might be one node makes three connections. And then all of a sudden it has a thousand connections. And so if it was the internet, you're talking about the development of social media, for example. And I thought, you know, there's this question, there was this Neolithic revolution theory, and there's all this, like, how come we went along for hundreds of thousands of years, and then only five or 7,000 years ago, we suddenly went nuts with all this uh, explosion of technology and so forth. And I thought, well, maybe the brain just got to the point where it went super critical. And... Uh, when that happens, the trajectory, as you talk about, of evolution is kind of thrown up in the air. It would be very easy for uh, for humans to sort of get stuck on a track, which is, which I don't know, it was just a thought. Um, I've got lots of other notes, but I'll just, I'll <laughs> restrain myself. Uh, I want to put you in touch with Gavin Anderson, if you, but I think you already are, who is hangs out with the San people these days. Um, uh, what was the other one? I see a lot of alignment between you and what McGilchrist is saying. And one of the marvelous things about it is that you come up underneath some of the things he's talking about, like uh, co-creation. Um, he's very big on the idea that we don't create the world and the world doesn't create us, but it's a, in the, in the moment, we co-create the universe. Uh, so I thought that was fascinating because, yeah, you know, you guys probably didn't know each other for 40 years. <laughs> 
And here you come uh, with this same general idea. And of course, your views on the development of the right brain are right up McGill, Chris Alley. And I think that you share some of the same sources. Mm -hmm. uh, one big one that I can't remember the name of at the moment that McGill Chris refers to all the time. So anyway, what a what a powerful and loaded and weighty presentation. I'm glad I took notes and I'm going to study it. <laughs> Thank you. There are longer presentations of this information with more detail online. So if you go to evolvenouse.org. Yeah, I'm I'm slogging through your books, and it's not because they're a slog, it's because I'm, I'm an old person with a deteriorating brain. <laughs> the process, uh, the uh, ongoing co-creation is process philosophy. Alfred North Whitehead and others uh, talk about that, but maybe the anthropologists want to say something about the shift. Uh, the Neolithic shift, I, I think there's a degrading of the evolved nest back then had uh, had something to do with this shift. But I don't know if you guys want to say anything about that or just. There's back. the movement from this, the moon yeah. to the sun. The shift from the uh, lun lunar. You can't, you, can't, you can't do, you can't sow seeds and reap them, you know, within the same month. But you, you so you get a seasonal emphasis instead of a monthly emphasis i mean that's a very short way of saying it but to, as soon as you've got the sun instead of the moon you've immediately disempowered women and then that's the end of it all i'd be very skeptical about any kind of argument that tried to say farmers and hunter gatherers have different brains and yep. and and uh, ascribes hunter gatherers to some sort of primitive level of it i would really reject this kind of thing having worked with hunter gatherers and i'm sure more <laughs> Their brains are absolutely as creative and 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 aware and modern and contemporary as any human mm -hmm. brain at all. Um, so I describe it to social contexts and conditions and patriarchal tendencies of control. So there are some situations and conditions where men can be can be men's dominance can be pushed back against and other situations, conditions where the odds are stacked against women if women have difficulty in maintaining collectivity. And in certain farming situations, particularly with the tendency of farming communities to send women to patrilocal marriages, um, that would be a, a, a way that women's you know, power base would be eroded. And I would suggest that that's that's a starting point for analyzing these this different balance and and um, the the whole kind of feedback process of status and control being 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 so male dominated and being um you know, that that being the kind of the the reason for human existence the, the going to very ego-centered um type of sort of epic hero mentalities yeah and let me say one other thing I meant to say, and that is that the unnestedness affects male brains and male development more than female because boys have less built-in resilience and they take longer to mature. And we provide less nourish, nurturing to boys. And so you end up with this survival systems in charge. And they, what else are they gonna do? They don't, they don't, they haven't built all that relational yeah. attunement flexibility in the unnestedness. Yeah. If I may, please, um, Darsha, one of, one of Darsha's papers that she wrote that, that touched me, I just love it. Um, and it's called The Missing Mind. That was part of the title of it, The Missing Mind. And she went back and described um, during the axial phase, this is uh, Lao, Tzu, Lao Tzu and and Confucius way back in the BCs. And again, I'm not an academic, so forgive my lack of accuracy with the dates. But um, she described what was the normal state of mind um, at that. And in one of her slides, she put at the very beginning a quiet mind. Now, so we have to differentiate between our cognition or what we call thinking or thought which in my view is evolved as a defense mechanism 
to to meet the meet the current challenge. So thought is really fundamentally defensive. And in this in this um, paper that she wrote, she um, she really described how the whole state of mind was completely different than what we would consider our normal state. So most of most modern mind is dominated by um, linear cognitive thinking, worrying, projecting, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Darcy, if you could maybe just touch on that because this lack of nurturing predisposes the explosion of this thought process, which is pred predictive and controlling and defensive, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this perfect storm going on um, that has evolved for um, a long time. Yeah, so one of the characteristics that we can see in the thousands of years ago is the ability, uh, it, uh, this is the Western world mostly uh, described by historian Marvin Bram and others, that the uh, orientation to de-differentiate from others, to always find what's connected and what what unites you. And instead of the, the left brain, you know, how are you different from me? What category can I put you in when I meet you? Uh, so this um, ability to be polyphonic, polysemous, poly, poly, I don't know how to say the word, sorry. <laughs> but to be very uh, multi uh, perspective taking. And that's something that we lose when the left brain kind of takes over because it can only deal with linear progress and linear kind of causal kind of chain thinking. Uh, so I think, yeah, they, and you can, John Young talks about uh, his translator. He asked uh, when he was with uh, Bushman, um, they asked a question and five women talked at once to the translator, uh, uh, the answer. And the translator could take it all in, was able to express, you know, what each one, uh, we can't do that. Can we, <laughs> we can only focus on one thing. So there's a diffuse attention that we've lost or we, we underdevelop and in other capacities. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. And then should go to Mona, I think. Thank you very much for your presentation and, and for those of you organizing this meeting. Um, I've been working on a project. It's going to appear through Bloomsbury Press as a book next year, probably, on um, European churches and Chinese temples as neurotheatrical sites. And it touches on many of the areas of your presentation. So I'm excited to learn about your work, um, especially because I look at the family paradigms of patriarchal, maternal, and trickster figures in those re religious sites uh, comparing West and East. My question though is because I'm also very interested coming from the background of theater and film studies as well as performance studies, how current screen media are affecting what you're calling the evolved nest? Uh, well, if we take each aspect component of the nest, um, like birth experiences, the screen media, well, I don't know what you mean by screen media, but I know that, do you mean uh, social media or do you mean movies and TV no, and everything? I, I, I'm thinking of what I grew up with, television and movies, okay. but how, when my children were growing up, it was the beginnings of video games and dial up internet, which was slow. And now what I observe in my college students, you know, that they've been, especially since the pandemic, raised from a very young age, as I understand it, you know, even babies with handheld screen media as the mirrors yeah. that are substitute nurturing transitional spaces, but uh, their friendships, their social media, and liking connections are very much through, you know, TikTok and Instagram, where it's the screen reflecting or giving value to my identity and not as much the interpersonal, as you pointed out, holding spaces or touching of actual humans. Right. Yeah, I was going to, there's uh, multiple effects, I think. I was going to say, uh, if we were just to talk about birthing, uh, that watching Hollywood movies makes you think that it's a horrible experience and you have to have painkiller and, you know, the doctors know best and all that crazy stuff like that. So you, 
uh, most doctors haven't even seen uh, uh, obstetricians have never seen a natural birth. <laughs> they think that the medicalized birth is normal. So it, it shrinks your imagination when you watch uh, things. Uh, I think this was a critique by Jerry Mander many decades ago saying if you watch a kiss uh, in a movie or on TV, that actually impairs your own experience of your first kiss. So there's all that happening. Now, in terms of uh, developing the brain and being in front of screens, we know the, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended that children not be exposed to screens until after age two, because it's related to uh, attention hyperactive uh, or ADD, attention deficit disorder, and other attention disorders, because uh, the brain is developing so rapidly, right? And it just is not the that the flashing light of the, at least the old TVs affects the, the brain and uh, other things is, you know, you can't do experiments on these things. So uh, it's all correlational. Uh, but in terms of the uh, screen, uh, I'm reminded of a historian, a famous historian whose uh, name I forget, who says he took his students to uh, Ellis Island and uh, wanted them at night and they could look at the vista of New York City and the lights and everything. But there was this huge um, photograph of the same thing on the wall and the students took pictures, selfies of themselves with the picture instead of with the real thing right there in front of them. <laughs> so there's an orientation of, of being, uh, the world is the screen, right? So you've now shrunk uh, again, imagination and capacity. And when we're with people, we have to adjust and you read faces and the screen doesn't do that. The screen is just, you know, reacting to things. And so you don't develop all this flexible intelligence. Other people might want to say something. Oh, but thank you though for that, because I also uh, see what in what you're doing and what I'm trying to do, a recognition of how it's uh, affecting our brain circuits. And so maybe that left hemisphere enhancement and right hemisphere deficit is also increased by the screen media and, and the types of figures. I, I focus especially on melodramatic hero, victim, villain types. So thank you. Yeah, so the survival systems are gonna be oriented to dominant submission. That's the way the world works, right? So you're gonna be oriented to hero and the villain and you gotta kill those people and eradicate whatever it is that's evil good and bad, you know, all this black and white. You don't get a lot of grandmother hypothesis in Hollywood films, let's put no. it that way. No, oh, it's more, uh, kids are resilient. It doesn't matter what you do to them. <laughs> can we go for Mona now, I think, because we've got about 40 minutes left and I think we want to have some. That would leave five minutes for discussion at the end, yeah. Well, let's let's go with, with Mona's stuff and try and bring some together. Yes, thank you everyone and, and thank you so much Darcy for just filling out so beautifully what Camilla said. I feel like the two of you are by yourselves. Have, you've, you've basically said it, but I'm, I'm going to try and put a wee bit of skin around it now. Um, and I'm not going to talk for long, I think, because we have a really interesting discussion going. I hope I won't talk for too long. I will say that and then I ramble on. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I've been thinking so much about this virtual hug that our kids are currently getting, you know, to as a substitute, of course, for real touch, you know, real kind of deep body connection. Um, and I, I see how my own kids are suffering in that and yet compelled by it because it's, you know, it, it is it is feeding some part of the brain in ways that, you know, at least they're getting some sense of, you know, um, quick hit fulfillment, rather than if we look around at the society we live in, no fulfillment, <laughs> right? So um, it's better than nothing, but it's really a virtual, virtual hug or a virtual pacifier in some ways for the younger ones. Um, and I've been thinking about that for a while alongside people like the Ben Jelly um, and what it is that they're really doing and giving to their children, to their babies and to themselves. 
Um, and they, they are really the personification of everything you've just said, Darcy. Um, I, I'm amazed by the fact that um, we have such concrete evidence for what uh, an organic community, which is empowered and empowering looks like. And the fact that so few folk actually are aware of this data, this information. And I think it's more and more part of the kind of mission that we have to be on as you know, academics. I don't really know if I'm even an academic at this point. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm masquerading as one, but certainly to, to get that information out in ways that can, can be accessed by everyone. I mean, this is a global conversation at this point. Um, and it really is now a matter of survival, child survival. I, I keep saying to people, you know, if somebody told you your, your kids are at risk right now, you know, what are you going to do? Um, they would act. People would suddenly find time to step away from their emails and, you know, their, their own personal um, busyness. And we all have so much going on. But um, so rather than go off on that tangent, because what I know is that all the theory in the world um, can't really um, get us to step up to the things that we're addressing here, the need for real connection and uh, uh, attention to others that's healthy and, and nurturing, unless we begin to change the ways that we are bringing up um, our young. Uh, because by the time you get you know, to, to addressing adults, there's there's so much work that has to be done to try to get back to that feeling state and and in other ways there's there's actually um it's amazing how how this resonates with all of us um so um the the benjele i think what i what i'll do um uh, because i want to come back to some of the things that you said uh darcia but what I'll do is look at a couple of slides from this um, public uh, talk that I was giving a couple of months back, just trying to sketch out some of my ideas about why we need to be looking really closely at societies like the Benjeli for a non-academic audience. Um, and, and I won't talk too much um, around those because they weren't prepared for this in, in particular, but um, just to kind of give some, give a wee bit more substance to what I'm saying. So let me see if I can share those. Okay, so um, this is really a story that I've talked about uh, before quite a few times. Um, and I, I I want to I want to return to it because um, what we're really talking about when we talk about Richard Lee's fierce egalitarianism is that you know we kind of have two different power principles or 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 um, uh, social principles at play um, and when we're looking at people like the Benjeli or the Juntua and the ways that they are cultivating this collective body, which is what they do even from before birth, we're looking at what happens when the principles um, uh, of, the, of, of the maternal body and, and then also to some extent of the, pa the parental body and then of the alloparental body, when those principles actually get um, carried out into cultural form. Um, it, this is what we're seeing when we look at it, uh, the Benjeli and what they're doing. So they're expressing the cultural principles of the female body. They're collectivizing that sense of a, a cooperative body and, and they're pushing it out into these incredibly sophisticated um, social, political, ritual, conceptual forms 
um, and it's really, I suppose, one of the reasons that I find it astonishing that these groups have been referred to as primitive or simple. This kind of egalitarianism is, you know, the, the absolute best, as far as I can see, that we can do uh, in terms of political, social, spiritual sophistication. You're really drawing the, the full potential of the person out into this this bigger body and then you're you're embedding that community body into a, an even bigger body which is the forest the environment the whole kind of in, intersociality of the other species around you and then as Darcia said you're then embedding that in the realm of the spirit um and yet interestingly enough and it turns out it's causal. These people own almost nothing in terms of stuff, material goods. They're the antithesis of capitalism, um, both, you know, politically and 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 when we look at what they're actually doing um, socially. But but just in a day to day, minute by minute orientation against privatization, against ownership. Um, and one of the, so this was me talking to just why, why I, I think this slide is really interesting. One of the moments where I, um, which I returned to from my field work where I, I realized what I'd been looking at in this picture is um, um, where I kind of had a, a, an epiphany uh, about what I was doing there and what it is that I wanted to share about the, the Benjeli. So this is um, Ngonya, um, my next door neighbor at Mbule. Um, it was a semi-permanent camp um, up close to the Motaba River in Northern Congo. Um, and in this photograph, she's marking everyone in camp with Ngele paste, which is a, a kind of mashed up red wood paste. Um, um, now, Ingele paste can be used for a variety of things. Uh, it can signal um, danger, it can signal illness, it can signal ritual power, um, uh, and also protection. So in this case, I watched um, as this mother of two three-month-old twins uh, who were at the time unwell, marked everyone in camp from, from you know, toddlers right up to the oldest people um, with an arc of a gele paste. And her co-mother, her alo mother is, is sitting close to her, hold, her holding the other baby. Um, and it was only a long time later that I understood what I was actually seeing um, what, as I began to fill out my own experiences by conversations with people like Jerome Lewis, um, another uh, anthropologist or uh, Benjele anthropologist um, and the literature, the wider literature um, and to reflect on what it is that had happened prior to and after this photograph was taken. So essentially these girls were ill um, and the Ingele paste was being put on physically in this really tactile gesture to the bodies of everyone else in camp um, as a means to share the illness, as a means to kind of diffuse the illness outward so that every person in the camp was holding a little piece of the sickness for these tiny girls, um, taking on a, an element of their illness and carrying it. Uh, and. I had looked at the way everything else was being shared out meticulously. You couldn't even hand someone a few cigarettes before everyone descending and they had to be shared out. Um, um, it, or if they couldn't all be shared out, then you know everyone took turns smoking them, but you, you had to have your share. But I hadn't thought that you would actually share on this level where you know, you're no longer carrying the burden of being an individual body you're no longer carrying the burden of being an individual ego, a discrete, closed self who gets sick and has to cope with that alone. You're now able 
to, to your, your entire person, including sickness, can be shared by this big community organism or body that, that you're part of in these cooperative um, cooperative um, childcare communities, these communities full of allo parents. Um, and it really struck me because I was experiencing myself as so closed off uh, and individual um, and separate from this kind of beautiful, uh, resonant, polyphonic, moving, you know, community. This is almost like the community itself was a, a big musical instrument that, that was kept running all of the time. But to, to, to get that insight, to realize that you're, you're not talking anymore about the will to share or, you know, maybe I'll give you this because I want to be uh, altruistic or generous. It's moved way beyond that level. Y you're, you're sharing body because there's nothing else to do. You, you are part of a larger body. And, and within that, this is also part of an even larger body. And that's part of an even larger body. The sense of a continuum from that one vulnerable newborn right out into the universe is unbroken for the Ben Jelly. And, and, and I think for, for um, groups, similar kinds of groups who demonstrate um, this fierce egalitarianism along with cooperative childcare practices, um, which are, are, are so, um, so detailed and so insistent that it kind of goes right back to the experience this baby is having, as Camilla said, um, even in the womb, actually, these, these babies are being danced because their mothers dance a lot and sing a lot. Um, but from the moment of birth to be given into the arms of everyone else, to be literally passed around the community. Um, and Turnbull, Turnbull tells us that this is done with the explicit aim of letting the newborn sense that it is part of a larger body letting it pick up the pheromonal um, input of other bodies. So the sweat, the breath, the heartbeat of, of multiple others. Um, and when you look at this image, it, it reminds me what I was, as well of um, Peter Gow's work with the Piro, the Amazonian Piro, completely different group, completely different part of the world. But again, we have this constant reinforcing of the idea of, of um, what the Piro call not self. They don't really have much of a term for self. Their, their term um, translates as multiple selves. Um, so even selfhood can't be located in, in uh, the idea of the individual. It's multiple. And this is very much what, what the Benjeli and, and what so many groups, um, which as Darcy will know, are, are doing. They're, they're setting out explicitly to create this kind of, this experience of the body. Um, so in many ways, they are working, um, working in a very matter of fact way against that trauma experienced um, baby, child, adult that we're having conversations about now. Um, and at the same time, uh, they're um, still, I, I, I think that what they're actually doing socially, politically, um, and in terms of well-being is, is, is relatively, um, I wouldn't say unknown because we, we have a, a big literature now on alternative ways of doing culture and being a body. And, and we have amazing work like um, Darcy's, but I think still in the public, in the public debates, um, there seems to be a kind of cynicism um, about the fact that these people are in fact the most intensely sophisticated human groups that we are aware of. Um, 
So this is something that is really crying out to be addressed. Um, the knowledge of what people like the Benjeli are doing in order to cultivate that collective sense of self and the ways that it, it shapes everything, uh, you know, every possible level afterwards um, are, are, I suppose, part of the discussion that we want to have today. Um, so I'll just move to uh, the bottom couple of slides that um, I used in this in this talk. Um, there are lots of other things that I that I would like to say, but um, I want to kind of look at the idea of morality and um, what I've called corporeal morality, spookily close to anything that I've read of Darcy is. Um, um, but this idea that um, so Aquila and Nom are to Imbangeli and Jun Toile terms respectively that speak really strongly to the idea of power. And power is always rooted in the body, generally around the, the solar plexus or gut area, um, the womb area. So for the Jun uh, for the Benjele, Aquila and Nom are embedded in individuals but they're inseparable from the collective. So they are this kind of um, what I've called corporeal morality, but really just a physical conscience, a sense of physical conscience that's rooted in the gut area and then cultivated all through life through many different ritual practices. Um, but I, I argue that this begins with the... Um, the respect for the evolved nest that these peoples have. It's at the heart of their culture, the respect for properly creating um, and expanding that, that sense of the evolved nest within the body of the, the person. Um, and so for me, terms like Aquila or Nom, referring to all kinds of different forces and powers in the universe of, of the Benjeli, um, cosmological um, universe of the Benjeli or the Nom uh, or the, the Juntua, um, are really where the, the heat of the community is stored. So yes, very much embedded in the physical body, but only because the physical body of every person is a constituent kind of molecule of the shared body. Um, and so these concepts, these practices, these uh, the, the cultivation of these skills is really where the, the bioenergy of the community is, is stored. And the, the beauty of these systems is that that, that core energy, that, that power force or sense of the self, or sense of the, the body as powerful um, is being uh, embedded in the the womb gut area and and therefore things like you know um this touches a lot on chris's work y you get a real sense of things like menstruation for example as as a, a mnemonic that the body itself becomes a memory center it, it becomes a way to grow and remember and share these really deep concepts that will allow uh, the cultivation of an egalitarian um, body dominated not by the principles of control, obedience, privatization, ownership, but of the principles of contact, response, touch, uh, you know, feeling into the bodies um, and of others and the bodies of the forest and, and then you know, beyond that into conversations with spirits. Um, and so I was just trying to, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to talk for much longer. I was trying to fill this out for people who aren't um, anthropologists, some of whom are, are have no real um, interest in academic learning, for example. So this was a real kind of public um, taster talk just to, to, to um, 
uh, to address a, a wide community of folk who, who, you know, come along to hear an interesting talk on, on one theme or another. I think they were probably, um, uh, so, some of the people at the talk were probably um, wondering what on earth they had wandered into. But by the end, we had a brilliant conversation. Um, and anyway, these are some of the things that I wanted to just kind of reinforce at the end of this. So what are these cultures doing? They're creating persons who are fully rooted in the body, earthed persons whose sense of trust in their own proficiency is really exceptional. And we see this across the board with hunter-gatherers. Then they're creating bodies which are fully rooted in the community. Um, and that's what I've been talking about with things like ekila or nom. Um, this kind of somatic, conceptual, umbilical cord um, that extends every individual body uh, or earthed person into a collective body. Um, and then they're creating communities on the basis of that, which are fully rooted in the forest. Um, so for the Benjele, that takes all kinds of shapes, uh, dance, ritual practices, singing, trancing, um, along with forest subsistence practices, which keep people in this um, really rich conversation with the forest and with the other species in it, um, are keeping the community porous. So porous enough to be woven into this bigger ecological body, um, in Benjele terms, the parental body. So essentially, these are women got centered rather than primarily brain centered social galaxies. They're operating by different sets of principles. Um, and then what does that do to our way of thinking about power and the way that we experience power, the way that we share power, the way that we understand power? Because, you know, if you if you asked my kids, how would you define power? They might apply it to their experiences of school where power is inherently negative. It's top-down, it's obedience-based, um, it's to do with authority figures. Um, the kind of power that people raised in these cultures begin to experience very young and go on to refine throughout their lives is a completely different experience of power. It's based on sharing, it's based on autonomy, um, dialogue and dialogism. Um, it's based on an understanding that you can perform conflict, uh, a bit like the chimp conflict that we talked about. You can take that potential for conflict and you can turn it into theater at such a refined level um, that <laughs> we talk about virtual world. This is true virtual power. You can almost see the lines of it running through these communities when they dance. It's really extraordinary to watch um, male and female ritual coalitions with babies dancing um, to each other, conversing with each other through dance. Uh, and I have so many um, memories of feeling as though I could actually see these elastic lines stretching between coalitions and thinking this is this this totally transforms my prior understanding of power and what power is um so i mean talking about morality and corporeal morality embedding the sense of the moral in the body early on we're really talking about um power as kept um as kept alive yeah, in the physical body and then in the social body as soon as it gets um, stopped as soon as one person or one group of people are able to take power permanently it dies um, I, I argue what real power living power power that makes us feel amazing power that makes us want to care for each other that form of power actually begins to die in, in the person. Um, and I think one of the most tragic things that you can watch is what happens to many teenagers as they progress through 
the, the kinds of social systems we've designed. Um, so power rooted in persons, which has to be shared and kept dynamic to thrive. Um, and I argue that that's political intelligence as the body. Um, and so I'll finish there really. I, I suppose what I just want to say in closing is that um, this, this idea of power in the body, power in the collective body, um, isn't really talking anymore about biology. Um, we're, we're talking about the biology expanding out into this incredible cultural resource um, and potential uh, for, for living within what Darcy is calling the evolved nest. Um, so yeah, I think that's me finished. I'm glad he didn't keep it too short. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Mona. That's great. Do people want to respond to um, to any of that? One thing that just came to mind, I've been reading Neil Douglas Klotz, who translates uh, Jesus's words from Aramaic. And most of the, the Bible translations we know come from a Greek version. And the Aramaic is rich and it talks about womb consciousness and the kinds of things you're talking about, which is what? <laughs> so the Middle Eastern mysticism is in Jesus' words. Uh, and it's similar to what you're um what you've described, Morna. It's just wonderful. Thank you. I like what she said. I, I would just quickly uh, say that. Klotz's translations are deeply contested. I, I love the vibe of them, but from a scholarly perspective, there's a lot of people who say like, this is new age woo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love them, the woo. Just wanna, yeah, like, I'm not woo, like, I'm not anti woo, but just there's a lot of scholarly pushback against his very popular uh, translations. Well, the word for kingdom is actually a feminine word. So he talks about queendom which is one thing that's interesting, yeah. Could I just quickly come back to, to what Mona was um, speaking about? Because uh, as she was talking, I was, I was thinking about the use of the term alloparent, which comes from Sarah Hurdy being sociobiologist, and of course, this is intensely individualistic methodologically. Um, so it's identifying this person is not the parent, but behaving as if the parent. So it's creating a deliberate sort of separating out. And the more the Mona was talking, of course, I'm thinking, but this is the opposite of what the Abengele are doing, which is to create everybody becoming collectively parental to for these twins with their beautiful cosmetic sharing and action expressed through the Enguele. Um, and so there's something, the real tension between the ways that no matter how fantastic Sarah Hurdy's theory is the ways it's expressed compared to the practice, the bodily practice of what the Evangelii do to actually create this communal collective childcare. Um, and, it, and it's that, that tension. It was just one, one other thing to talk about with Akila and, and Igonjwa, the, which is the theory of the child's growing up. Um, that I've learned about from Dasha Bombyakova's work, also with the Abengele. And so these, these little babies have to go through this process of being grown um, and parents, the actual parents, there's quite a lot of work from the community to make sure that with all this cooperative childcare, the actual parents don't kind of slack on the job. 
they have to be intimately connected through Ekila, the fact that their Ekila, their moral force, if you like, which is both uh, belonging to a person, but also interrelational, and for a woman is very strongly marked as, menstru as menstrual cycle and reproductive cycle for a man in, in relation to hunting and then interrelated the interdependency of that. But their child as growing up is reliant on that Ekila until the child acquires Ekila of it, of it their own. Um, so this is kind of a, a tussle between the, big, the whole community body and the actual parents, you know, you've got to actually look, you're really connected to this child physically in that corporeal sense. And there, and there must be a, a, a such a, you know, that, that's the evolved, that is the evolved nest for the Evangelae in, in, in many ways. It's embedded, as you say, in these matrices of, of bigger and bigger expansive bodies. Um, can I just, <coughs> sorry, um, well, Mona, as you know, whenever you speak, I just get, get kind of carried away and wish you do, wish we could all hear more of it. Um, okay, I mean, I, 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 we have hardly got any time now, but um, just a, a kind of question. Carry on a bit, Chris, we don't have to shut down. Okay. Um, why was it that when you came to Aquila, um, you only mentioned menstruation in connection with the work of Chris Knight. I mean, I, I just think that's completely wrong. Um, surely you must know that Akila, if you had to pick on one of the many meaning, meanings of that term, it's menstruation. I mean, Jerome makes it absolutely clear. And I, what, I, the reason I stress this is because so many of the things which you and Dasha and Camilla have talked about, they, they translate. Western culture is fine about it. And actually capitalist culture is fine about caring and community and song and all this stuff, as long as it's kind of, you know, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice? But the one thing which Western culture of any kind, including the left and whatever feminists and stuff, they won't have menstruation. It can't be treated as sort of relevant to all the things we're talking about. So if I could just ask you, Mona, could you say a little bit more about what Akila means? <clears throat> Sure, Chris. Yeah, I know you're, you're um, well, basically, I, I think the, the generalities of Aquila are, I mean, it's a polysemic term, isn't it? So it's, it's, it's not just, it's not just expressing menstruation. A bit like nom, I mean, for nom, Junto nom, menstruation's at the heart of it. The same with Aquila. Um, so it's like that red thread, you know, the, the blood thread. And, and of course, why not? Because if we're talking about, okay, a scenario where you take the deep principles of the maternal body, let's say, and you turn those into culture, there'll be, you know, pregnancy, there'll be childbirth, but centrally there'll be menstruation. There'll be this ability that the Benjele and other hunter-gatherers talk about to, to, to bleed without um, dying and, and to renew oneself through blood and to be connected to the moon through, through your bleeding and to be connected to all the other women in, a, in the vicinity through menstrual synchrony. Um, and so if we're taking the, the template of the female body as a kind of driver for the way culture shapes out of these cooperative communities, then that's central. But I think what's really important to emphasize is that Akila then links to ev everything, anything else in the Benjeli world that signifies power. And that includes men's bodies, men's spirits, um, you know, game animals in the forest. Um, it, it, it connects, well, the beauty of it is it's a web. And, and I think, you know, understanding it as a web and at, at the core of it, Chris, honestly, at the core of things like Aquila, I don't know if I would put menstruation. I think I would put a baby. I think I think babies are the core of these societies. Ultimately, um, menstruation, of course, is what happens. So to let you have a baby, 
Um, and it's it's a hugely valuable resource and signal and, and an expression of power for young women, especially in these communities. You may even Colin Turnbull's work on the, the beautiful ritual expressions around menstruation. You know, you, you can see that. Um, my, my point is just that Western patriarchal culture is fine about babies, yeah. but it's not yeah. fine about the moon. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, it's, well, it says it's right. Like they say they're fine about babies, but the, but the Catholic Church and all the other patriarchal yeah, religions, the them. thing they're not quite keen on is two things, women and the moon. Uh, and so it just seems to be quite important to be not to be too um, sort of new agey, not to be too going along with a sort of flow about isn't everything lovely and I don't know. There's certain things which need to be, which, you know, <laughs> emphasise against the stream. And you're very good at doing that, Mona. But I, I just think it's so important not to compromise with our culture and those questions. Menstruation is a source of pride for those men, Jedi women, um, as you, you know, as, as for so many egalitarian hunter gatherers. All that shame nonsense is nowhere near anything, and it's it's critically important because otherwise women are being put down because they're women through because they've got that body. <clears throat> Well, I think just just um, very briefly, Chris, I think also menstruation is a really vital mnemonic device because um, generally speaking, it happens for all women. And if you kind of if, if you if you tuck all the most important cultures into that um, and these are cultures, you know, which are, of course, dynamic and oral cultures, if you if you if you can find things to anchor that ritual solidarity like like menstruation um it it's it's so potent it's so so important and it's so important like you said for women's ritual groups as well i know that thank you yeah. we're, we're nearly at advertised time but um perhaps some other people would like to to talk and respond or ask questions, and we can carry on a little longer if you like. It's Peter. Peter, did you have a hand up? Or I did. I was uh, I was having technical difficulties. <laughs> um, we passed uh, through a question of what's wrong with humanity, and um, I I don't want to drag us back to it, but I had I had something that I wrote that I like to put in the chat. It's a few paragraphs. Um, and the essence of it is that our culture in the West is evolving uh, very rapidly. <laughs> and the technological breakthrough internet uh, has, you know, it has two sides to it. The side I don't want to put in the chat because I didn't write it down is uh, about Zoom and face-to-face connection at a scale of billions and billions of people around the world. Uh, that cannot be uh, without effect. And I'm hoping beneficial effect. We really don't know what happens between faces and brains, uh, especially when they're all the size of postage stamps. But it's but the scale of this is mind boggling. So I think that's I think that's hopeful. The thing I want to put in the chat is just that uh, the technological breakthrough didn't it didn't change the uh, economic paradigm. It just created a new market, a new dominant market in uh, aggregated attention, which is cheaper and more portable and more lucrative than information. And so uh, the stuff that our kids are looking at on the internet, for instance, um, the content is not being decided, designed by people, but it's being designed uh, to use the parts of our brains evolved for interacting with each other. 
So there's a robot that's <laughs> is feeding us all this stuff. So I'll put this in because it's a little more cogent than, I, than I'm speaking it. Um, and uh, Morna, I just find your presentation deeply moving. I could uh, I could go I could listen to it for years. Yeah, me I too. just hope you're I hope you're getting out there because you have really important things to, to mm -hmm. bring to people. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Yeah, I, th I think these conversations are are really essential, even over Zoom. Which is a poor substitute for what we'd, you know, be feeling if we were all sitting in a room together. Um, the conversations are really vital, and the ways that we kind of keep them going. Um, we have questions, I think, as well from Mark and then from Kathy. Yeah, just quickly, if it's a huge question, but if anyone wants to respond, I'm wondering about the pressures on women. Um, who want to be both in a career and yet have children and don't have the alloparenting resources and how that's been increasing in our industrialized technological societies, uh, the West especially where um, there's not a, so, so that how do you feel about childcare places becoming substitutions for maternal and grandparental home domestic nurturing spaces when when women in career jobs are pressured to go back to work quickly i'll jump in um they can be good places if they follow evolved nest uh, um, components most of them do not most in, don't have enough uh, adults to, especially for babies babies need to be you know pretty much carried all the time and on skin to skin or in arms or on backs. And uh, most places don't do that. We have at Evolve Nest a, a child care checklist for parents or child care givers young, for young children. So um, there are places or businesses uh, that are trying to get babies to work and to have child care at work. So the mom can uh, just be there uh, or dad uh, down the hall from the child. So that, that's a better option. And also having local work near your home instead of commuting far away. So yeah, it's uh, allo, uh, the allo parenting part is important, but it needs to be stable, responsive, the same people over years with that child and not uh, shifting strangers doesn't work so well for the child because the child doesn't feel known and doesn't develop the the back and forth games or interactions that you do when you have a relationship, you you have familiar ways of getting along. So anyway, there's lots more to say about that, but that's maybe someone else. Could, could I just um, put in after Mark and after what you've said, Dasha, um, that the, the kind of hunter-gatherer context that Mona's described and which I knew with the Hadza as well, it does not separate into a domestic place with a mom and grandma and a public place. The women's bodies as a collective body are out there publicly in the center of camp. The, the center of camp is where they are with the babies. That's the center of the whole social nexus. And um, so it's a, it's a really westernized dichotomy, this public versus domestic and it doesn't correspond to the evolved nest as we really evolved. So I think that's, that's again, got to be addressed. Um, and we are, you know, we're, this break between women's work and, and their babies is, is catastrophic. It, it needs to be, yeah, it needs to be addressed. <laughs> it, yeah, even with our parents, the mother is typically around, yeah. Yeah, and also just to very, very briefly say, you know, I, I have experience of that, having come back from field work pregnant and had my baby, my daughter, um, here while doing a PhD. The, the loneliness that mothers are experiencing under these conditions is really um, 
destructive uh, to everyone. Um, and I was so conscious of the loneliness of becoming a mother here in contrast to what I'd witnessed. Um, and actually it, it, it kind of drove me to seek out um, in the later stages of my pregnancy, uh, another woman who I was kind of vaguely familiar with. She's now my best friend because we, at, you know, at least we could pull in a small group what we were going through and reinforce for each other all the attachment principles that we wanted to, you know, to apply as mothers, but it really felt like going against the flow. Um, and I'm often asked, um, um, not, not pointing any fingers, Chris, oh, why haven't you done this with your career? Why haven't you done that with your career? You haven't published your book. And I think, you know, they're wandering around the house there in the background. You know, my, my, um, my, my opus, my, my, my lifetime's work. Um, and they didn't have to be, um, they didn't have to, they, they could have worked beautifully with the professional work that I wanted to do. I just needed Benjeli society, effectively. Yeah. So that's all I'd say. Kathy. Kathy. Um, well, I, uh, I'm going to tag a little comment um, uh, onto this, this discussion about um, uh, the kind of dichotomy between, um, well, let's let's uh, let's have the allo parents right in the workplace, but what about doing the work while caring for the baby, where possible? That the baby isn't like separate from your work. That that workplaces should be set up. So that yes, there's allo parenting when necessary, but there's also parenting while working. I, I've got to believe the hunter gatherers don't separate parenting from work, whatever they might believe we mean when we say work. I'm not sure, do they even have the same sure. I, division of concepts? Okay. Uh, but mum gets a break sometimes when either little helpers or old women take over and that that does happen <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. okay so that was that was my tag on to the conversation the earlier conversation but my question is and i'm not sure there's an answer for it and hopefully people are investigating this how does all this discussion, knowledge that we're learning from traditional hunter-gatherers, how does that inform how our societies might ideally go forward? What do we take? How do we apply it? Uh, like I said, <laughs> not sure there's a answers to that one. Well, in terms of the evolved nest, you'd want to centralize the care caregiving of children uh, and uh, support of mothers and families uh, and have neighborhoods be more communal and break down the nuclear family in an isolated household. Uh, you need extended families together and non-kin even uh, who are there ready to pitch in and, and be available and playgrounds everywhere for all ages and there's lots of things okay. and reducing all the funds expended on military industrial prison military industrial complex to put that into the health care and support of children's nurture and you know these societies that are ultra egalitarian are just that they, they do not put their efforts into violence, except perhaps violence against animals, and that is incredibly um, hedged around in in how it's done. Uh, they put it all as as Mona says: the baby is at the center, the children are absolutely at the center. These societies who have no stuff are a welfare network for children that puts 
the US and soon I'm afraid our country as well to shame. Yeah, the, and, and guess what? Most people our, are happy. <laughs> in our country, there are children going to bed hungry, millions of children in our country going to bed hungry tonight. This could never happen in a hunter-gatherer camp. It couldn't happen. It wouldn't be allowed. I think I think Kathy's question needs a kind of attempted an answer on other levels. I mean, it's one thing to say what should happen, what we should have in terms of childcare and so on. But another thing to say is how what leverage do those of us, and hopefully there, there are millions more than just us, what leverage do activists have or people who are becoming activists to actually get it done? What kind of action, what kind of collective action will get the thing moving? Because you're not going to get it from politicians or the state, I'm afraid. I mean, it's just somehow we need to think in terms of the kinds of action taken by women in the past that got them to the egalitarian situation, such as we see among these egalitarian hunter-gatherers. And that was collective female solidarity, including quite, quite painful, if you like, measures against the what, what's, what is so often the dominant sex. So I'm just saying it can't all be sweetness and light and cooperation and harmony. There are certain forces in society which will do which will I mean, do anything to avoid losing power, I'm afraid. And that, that, that reality has to be faced. And then you have to look at which sections of society, uh, you know, clearly women, but not maybe not all women, but clearly most women have got it. And the point Mona makes is so brilliant. Supposing you told women, right, your, your kids, owing to climate catastrophe, your kids won't have a future. I mean, every woman on the planet that really grasped that would just do anything, take any measures necessary to secure the future of their, of their kids. So, I mean, that's a, a starting point, but of course it can't just be women. I mean, obviously women would need to get some allies from men and then you've got to work out, well, which men and so on. So I'm just saying, we need to look at it from the point of view of what kind of activism is realistically possible under our present circumstances that can get us from catastrophe to a, to a future and clearly, you know, as as as, as, as Dasha's book, uh, you know, as it says, it's kind of it has to be kind of back to the future, clearly. But simply sort of saying how wonderful hunter gatherers are, and and so on, that you know that we have to get to where there are on a, obviously on a huger level on a on a global level. Uh, obviously, nobody here thinks that you can just go back to using bows and arrows and that somehow somehow solve the problem. But I can see Marit has got a, a hand up, for, right. had a hand up for a long time. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I just, I was just thinking when, when you were talking, Mona, about that amazing thing about the, the paste, the, the mother putting the paste on everyone um, to help her twin babies, that we, we often talk about how our society is too individualistic, but I've never, I don't think I've ever really heard what it means not to be individualistic. And what you said about that just really, really struck home. And I just wondered if you and the others can say more about what it's like to be in a society that is completely not individualistic, that's completely cooperative like that. Mona's term for it was communism, communism in motion, which I think is the most genius way of describing that anyone's ever come up with. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 like a it's something I've gone on learning about um, Marit since I came back um, through, like I said, through conversations, but through reading, through 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 just kind of combing through the literature on on Central African hunter gatherers in in various places, and then in you know hunter gatherer groups in um, Amazonia or looking at the the Inuit. So it's it's corroborated by by research, and then I suppose it's underpinned by my experiences as a as a mum. What what I still what stayed with me about the the Benjeli and the experience of being there, like I said, is that sense of being surrounded by a single organism that was you know. Um, musical um, and physical and uh, sensuous and uh, 
it, it was just like this um, awareness of, of, of having entered a context where the, the latent potential that we have as, as bodies uh, was, was happening in, in front of me. Capacities um, to, to be so, so intensely connected to everything and everyone around you that you're almost vibrating with the collective energy. Um, it was invigorating and it was terrifying at the same time to me because when you start to see yourself, you know, you go as an anthropologist thinking I'm going to study people. Here I am, you know, with my notebooks and I'm an expert. You realize very soon that you're a child who's being studied. Um, and so I was, I was kind of like the, the, the entertainment for, for a lot of people a lot of the time. Um, and I was great entertainment because I, I really didn't have a clue and, and on so many levels. Um, uh, and I think they actually just really, in terms of um, the comedy value, I, I, before I had even tried to, you know, ex explicitly give anything back, I was giving I was giving something back in terms of my my comedy value. But uh, one of the one of the things that I realized, and I think I've said this before, is I realized really quickly that even Ben Jelly children were looking at me in a way that I never looked at. I've never been looked at anywhere else since. They would sit in front of me and they would look at me and they would just, you would feel as if you were being scanned from head to toe, um, you know, and they, the, the, the young women especially weren't engaging with this kind of etiquette of we're all fine and, you know, we'll all smile at each other to, to show that we're, we're fine and we'll engage in small talk, they would also just watch and listen uh, and, and study with such curiosity uh, and like a, a lack of self-consciousness that I, it, it began to, to show me how um, closed and how self-conscious and defensive I was. And I thought I was fairly open um, open-minded, open, you know, in terms of my 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 social uh, presence, and I I would actually love to. I, I think if we have more stories from anthropologists in those first weeks and months of field work, you know, the experience of themselves as bodies in relation to different cultures, it would be really interesting because that's where you begin to see. Um, you know, when I find when I when I read Darcy's work, you begin to see the effects of having been raised largely outside that that nest or by those principles, just because that's the way it's done. Um, yeah, I, I think the level of connection there is being constantly reinforced. Um, consciously by the community and, and by older women in particular, because it never stops. It's like a fabric that's, or, you know, a humming or a, um, a, an energy that's never switched off. And the whole community works on that. So even in the middle of the night, three, four in the morning, if there's been a dance, you'll still hear a few people singing around the fire. Um, like it will go right down to simmering the social space, the the, the noise and the, the 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 quality of the social space will go right down to simmer, but it will never get turned off. Uh, and that's really due to the fact that people are working as a as a collective body. And there's so much in the ethnographic literature on this, you know, the, the morality embedded in that body. The sense that you're not doing this, you know, to be good. You're doing it because there's nothing else to do. It's what you are. Um, and so that's where I think, you know, someone said, how do we begin to change things? And, you know, I know there are different approaches, but I think that's where looking at the information that um, Darcy is bringing, 
putting that together with the ethnographic information and the reality of communities like the Benjeli is hopeful because it's letting us see the kinds of things we have to start doing as in, in our own lives as well um, as collectively. If we want to begin to, to experience ourselves in that, in that way. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else has has anything to say on that. Let's just say Camilla wrote a rather an amazing piece recently on um, how to decolonize time and how who controls oh, time and how, how, to how, to how to breathe. How to breathe. It's called how to breathe. It's it is uh, one more attempt, but I think a brilliant one to try to make a start and so activism. Yeah. The the material factors of time and slowing down and reclaiming time have to be very significant for us to grapple with capitalism as the robbery of our time and uh, and the creation of inequality through time um that of course presses down on women above all uh, but uh, yeah, I can send a, a link for that one if anyone's interested. Um, I'm wondering if, if um, we need to kind of wrap this up with that lovely last piece that Mona's spoken, um, unless there are people who are burning for more questions. Uh, we've gone a little over time anyway. Um, Lots of hands went up for a link to that piece on time. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, uh, I need to pick it up online. I'll see if I can do that quickly. I won't close um, until that's been done then. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, okay. I'll try, and f I'll try and search it. Just to say, um, our last session is going to be with Chris and Mona, particularly in dialogue. Um, talking about language and laughter. So we're, we're gonna move on to that key question about evolution of language. This is not disconnected to everything that we've been speaking about today, because of course, of all the things that make us human language is such a is very special and unique phenomenon, um, but that emergence and evolution of language is highly, is very intimately connected to the relations of power of a very different sort that Mona is also speaking of and which the laughing body, she's spoken about this dialogic um, speaking body, this collective body. Um, so that will be, uh, I hope people will come back for that one. And just to say that is in five weeks time because we are following lunar cycle. You may not realize this. We are doing Saturdays after the new moon. It was a new moon yesterday. The Saturday in June after the new moon is the 24th. So it's five weeks today. So Mona put a note on that, okay? So we don't get the wrong day. Um, oh, thank you, Mark. You found the How to Breathe article. There it is. Thank you so much. That was very clever of you. Um, it'll be, yeah, it, it's quite a little, nice little read and some people might enjoy it. Um, so I, it, I think we're all right. We've we've just about got. I'd like to thank everybody for participation and thank you to Dasha and Mona for your wonderful um, presentations. And we've really covered a great deal of ground today. Um, it's it's been uh, quite a quite an inspirational. And thanks to, to Dasha. That's recorded. So hopefully we will get it to our Vimeo. Um, editor quickly and be able to put the recording up online um, and uh, see if I can download chat as well and send it to you. Okay, everybody, I'm going to press the, going to press this bright red button. Is that all, all right? right? Goodbye. Good evening. Good. Have Thank a nice you. day. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.